It is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Uh, we're just saying. One big happy uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the uh, Premier. Premier, after the uh, budget bill was rammed through committee and after it passed uh, yesterday, it gave me a chance to, uh, to reflect. It gave me a chance to reflect on its effect on the average Ontarian. Over and over again, I thought about what it will cost them. Premier, with the payroll pension tax, <clears throat> the aviation tax, the beer tax, the new income tax rate, and the skyrocketing hydro rates all included in the budget, mm -hmm. will you tell Ontarians how much the budget will cost them? Expensive. Very Well, Mr. Speaker, what the, um, what the member opposite could have been reflecting on is the investments that will uh, be well, made because of the budget yeah, yeah. bill that, uh, we, that has been passed, Mr. Speaker. $31 billion for moving Ontario forward projects, yeah. Mr. Speaker, transportation infrastructure across this province, Mr. Speaker, a plan for $130 billion investment over 10 years, and that's roads and bridges and transit in all parts of this province, Mr. Speaker, that will allow communities to thrive. He might have, uh, he might have reflected on the $20 million for uh, three years for the Experience Ontario program, Mr. Speaker, that's going to help graduating high school students to better identify their future goals by having a work experience opportunity, Mr. Speaker. He might have thought about the $250 million over the next two years for a renewed Ontario yes, new job strategy that has already seen uh, tens of thousands of young people in placements that have Thank led you. to jobs. He might have thought about those things, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Senior, Mr. Speaker, it's more than the costs that we know now. It's the hidden cost, too. 10,000 Ontarians reached out to the Ombudsman seeking help for hydro billing errors. Yeah. The Auditor General made it public the government wasted some $2 billion on smart meters. And the government's response? Independent oversight at Hydro One has ended. Hydro One raided the bank accounts of Ontarians, and these mistakes cost Ontarians $83 million all of which was made public because of independent oversight. No Premier, can you explain the cost of secrecy and losing oversight at Hydro One? Well, Mr. Speaker, to, uh, to just follow up on the theme of the, uh, the budget, the uh, member opposite might have thought about the uh, rate increases of 1% for social assistance recipients, Mr. Speaker. He might have, he might have thought about the, uh, the modernized student assistance program that's going to index a, the maximum aid to inflation, Mr. Speaker, and Ontario will be the first province to do that, and that will help our post-secondary students, Mr. Speaker. He might have thought about the $40 million that uh, we're putting into technology technology in classrooms, Mr. Speaker, right. for uh, students in kindergarten through grade 12, Mr. Speaker, that, 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 that those are all aspects of the budget. The member opposite knows that the oversight of Hydro One will be analogous to the oversight of other uh, publicly held companies, Mr. Speaker. He knows that that's the case. He knows that there are mechanisms in place yes, already. Sir. He knows there will be a, a special ombudsman for, the, uh, for Hydro One, Mr. Speaker. He Thank knows you. that those oversights already exist. Thank you. Final supplementary. Again to the uh, Premier, Mr. Speaker. Furthermore, the uh, cost doesn't stop with uh, the Hydro One fiasco. Despite some of Ontario's largest employers outlining the cost it will have to Ontario businesses and jobs, the Ontario Retirement Pension Plan was rammed through with the budget bill. Large or small, the majority of businesses will be negatively impacted by the ORPP. We ask the government to walk away, Nobody's hit pause, done. and rethink this job-killing plan, but to no avail. Premier, how many jobs will the ORPP cost Ontario when businesses fire employees rather than pay this new payroll tax. Many. Let me let me ask the uh, the member opposite how what the cost would be to allow a generation or two generations of people, young people now, to age and retire and not have adequate retirement security. So it's you know it is Member from Renfrew, the come to order. government to think beyond the next three years, the next four Member years. Member from Prince Edward Hastings, know, come to order. He knows 
People across the country know, the federal government even knows, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, no. that people in their 20s and 30s and 40s cannot put enough aside in order to assure a secure retirement. Right. They know that, Mr. Speaker. So if we all know that, is it not our responsibility to do something about that? Because the cost of not doing anything, Mr. Speaker, means that we have seniors retiring into insecurity. No question. The member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. My question is to the Minister of Energy. Minister, this morning we learned that a so-called smart meter caught fire and exploded in Collingwood. For months, you've been assuring the public that the smart meters in Ontario were not like the ones in Saskatchewan, that ours wouldn't catch fire, that only a few thousand would have to be replaced as a preventative measure in Sarnia-Lambton. Well, like so many things you've said on the energy file, your talking points like your smart meters have flamed out. Minister, if a smart meter in Collingwood could catch fire and explode, despite your assurances, how do we know there are not tens of thousands more just like it in the province of Ontario waiting to go off? Minister. Mr. Speaker, yes, uh, there was a fire in one of our 4.8 million smart meters uh, uh, in the last several days, Mr. Speaker. The ESA, the Electrical Safety Authority, is investigating that. There is no indication yet, Mr. Speaker, whether it was the meter or the installation or any other cause. Uh, we are awaiting the results of that investigation, Mr. Speaker, and uh, when we have the results of that investigation, Mr. Speaker, we will be able to respond. Supplementary. Well, meter or installation, whatever the problem is, I don't think that's much of an assurance, Minister. We know you refuse to admit that your smart meter tax machine program has been a disaster from the start, partly due to your abysmal administration of the rollout. Since the Auditor General report last December, the public understands that your smart meter fiasco will cost energy consumers double what you claimed it would. Wow. Smart meters haven't cut consumption at peak times, and often they don't even relay their information back to the central data centre. Yep. Now we learn that these devices may burn without warning and burn a ratepayer's house down. Yep. Minister, there are over a million of these so-called meters in Ontario because of you. What is your plan of action today, and how much more will this add to your $2 billion smart meter boondoggle? Minister. Mr. Speaker, the member should know that there are 4.8 million, not a million, smart meters in the province of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, uh, the reality is, Mr. Speaker, uh, if you listen to the Environment Commissioner of Ontario, Mr. Speaker, the Environment Commissioner of Ontario says of smart meters. They are necessary, absolutely necessary, for the proper functioning and future functioning of the distribution system for electricity. Smart grid technologies have the potential to improve reliability, reduce system costs, empower customers, and lower the environmental impact of the electricity we use, Mr. Speaker. There are many other endorse agents. And Mr. Speaker, if you talk to the LDCs, the electricity utilities, including the one that serves his community, they will say smart meters are a smart thing to do. Thank you. Final supplementary. I doubt it. I doubt it. I doubt it. Well, it's great that the minister is smart enough to count them. Maybe he could figure out how to make them work. <laughs> minister, this is priced precisely the sort of scandal that the Auditor General needs to investigate. But because of your shameful budget passing, yep. she no longer has the ability to do so. Gone. Every person who owns a smart meter is now worried theirs could catch on fire. Yep. Families do not trust your government to provide them with the peace of mind when they need on this, that they need on this. This incident proves today that your government simply can't be trusted on the issue. Minister, will you commit to allowing the Auditor General and the Ombudsman to continue to have oversight on Hydro One, even though you took it away with the passing of the budget? You see it, please. You see it, please. Minister. Mr. Speaker, the member knows that we have retained uh, former Auditor General of Canada, Denny Desotel, to oversee the implementation of an ombudsman at Hydro One, Mr. Speaker. His mandate is to ensure that the ombudsman will be transparent uh, and accountable, Mr. Speaker. That is moving forward. Mr. Speaker, 
Hydro One, as a TSX company, a, tra a stock trading company, Mr. Speaker, will have tremendous oversight. The Securities Act, Mr. Speaker, provides oversight, accountability, audited statements for every nature of the operations of a public company, Mr. Speaker. They will be accountable. Mr. Speaker, we are in the process of restructuring the board of Hydro One. We are also in the process, the, cha the chair of Hydro One now, Mr. Speaker, of selecting a CEO for Hydro One moving forward. It's the right thing to do, Answer. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. The leader of the third party. Uh, to the Premier, Speaker. The Premier is pushing ahead with their scheme to sell Hydro One. My question is, what's next? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, what's next is those investments in infrastructure that are being driven by the fact that we've found the revenue to make those investments, Mr. Speaker. That's the whole point of this. And I have said it over and over again in this House, Mr. Speaker. I understand that this is a difficult decision. I understand when we said that we were going to review our assets that that was a difficult thing to do, Mr. Speaker. But it is motivated by our understanding, our knowledge, that if we do not invest in the roads and the bridges and the transit that is needed in this province, Mr. Speaker, then we will rob the future generations of economic prosperity that is necessary. It's as simple as that, Mr. Speaker. We know we can thrive. We know that we can compete, but we can't do that without making these investments, and that's why we're making them, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Well, Speaker, yesterday, the Minister of Finance was asked, what's the next thing on the auction block going to be? He said, Right now, there is no determination. Minister of Agriculture. Now, I know the Premier says that she's been clear about her plan to sell off assets. Will the Premier make clear then exactly what the Minister of Finance was referring to yesterday? What is the next asset that's up for sale? Thank you. Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'll let the Minister of Finance uh, uh, speak to the details in the supplementary, but Mr. Speaker, what we are doing right now is we are working on making the investments in the roads and the bridges and the transit infrastructure that we know is necessary, Mr. Speaker. The leader of the third party, when she talks about assets, she has no solution for the investments in infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. She wants to talk in isolation about a particular ideological position that is underpinned by a total lack of confidence in anything that the private sector does, which I think, Mr. Speaker, is an interesting position for a, a, a responsible politician to take. The fact Member is, Hamilton, the government Stone has Street. to work with the private sector. It is absolutely essential that we work with all sectors in, in the community, with labour, with the private sector, to make sure Answer. that we get public policy right. This is public policy that is going to build assets for the people Thank of Ontario you. for this generation. Thank you. Stop the clock. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. The Premier says she was clear in her budget and in her platform about her plan for asset sales. Then she denied she was selling assets. Now she's denying that she ever even made that denial. And she won't say whether there are more sell-offs in the works. Speaker, it's getting pretty ridiculous. Why doesn't this Premier stand in her place? this time actually be up front with the people of Ontario, take this opportunity to be up front with the people of Ontario and tell them exactly what is next on the auction block. Thank you. Mr. Finance. Mr. Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, it was very clear on page 73 in terms of what it is that we are doing. And I did respond and I did actually follow up and determine what some of those properties would be. And I listed them in the, in the budget. We talked about Seton and Lakeview Lands. We talked about OPG's head office. We talked about a number of. Uh, uh, Finish, please. And Mr. Speaker, we talked about a number of properties that were unproductive that we wanted to ensure that we maximize by reinvesting them into infrastructure, into public transit, into things that will generate greater returns for the people of Ontario. Clearly laid out. Read it if you wish. But we're taking care of business and we'll continue to help the people Thank of Ontario. You. New question. The leader of the third party. 
Speaker, I advise you to lock up the mace. Uh, that might be next. Uh, my next question is for the, uh, the Premier. Speaker. The Premier kept Ontarians in the dark about her scheme to sell off Hydro One. Dr. Clark. Please ask. Kept Ontarians in the dark about her scheme to sell off Hydro One. She kept her ministers in the dark about her scheme to sell off Hydro One, and she kept her backbenchers in the dark about her scheme to sell off Hydro One. You know what, Speaker? This afternoon, this House is going to vote on whether or not to actually listen to Ontarians. Will this Premier allow her MPP backbenchers a free vote on whether or not they should be listening to the people in? In their ridings and hold a referendum Order. on the sell-off of Hydro One. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So let me just let me just say to the leader of the third party once again, and I will go through the uh, go through the statements that we made. Um, April 11th, 2014. The Ontario government has appointed a council to recommend ways to improve the efficiency and optimize the full value of Hydro One, unquote. 2014, in our budget, and I quote, we will look at maximizing and unlocking value from assets. The two-way conversation that's going on is uh, not helpful, and finger-pointing doesn't help, doesn't change my mind at all. <coughs> On. including real estate holdings as well as Crown corporations such as OPG, Hydro One and the LCBO. Page 257 of our budget, 2014, exploring options to unlock the full value of a wide range of valuable provincial Answer. assets, specifically the LCBO, Hydro One and the OPG. The member from Hamilton Mountain come to order. Speaker, why is this Premier more interested in hearing from a very small group of her friends her very powerful friends than she is from the people of Ontario, from Ontario in a referendum on the sell-off of Hydro One. Thank you. Senior. Mr. Speaker, I went through the, uh, the quotes of uh, what we said we were going to do. They were very clear, Mr. Speaker. There was an election on June the 12th, 2014, yes. Mr. Speaker. That election was based on the statements that had been made by the various parties. Our statements were very clear about the fact that we were looking at unlocking the value of our assets, Mr. Speaker. It, we hadn't been explicit about exactly what that was going to mean, Mr. Speaker, but we were clear enough. We were clear enough that the leader of the third party, the leader of the third party said. Yep. <laughs> Finish, please. Mr. Speaker, we were clear enough that even the leader of the third party could understand. And she said, the budget says in black and white that the government is looking at the sale of assets, including Crown corporations such as the Ontario Power Generation. I have um, all kinds of rights, and asking the House to come to order is one of them. Premier, finish, please. You have one wrap-up sentence. Just to say, Mr. Speaker, that was the budget that we campaigned on. We had the election, Mr. Speaker, and we are moving ahead to implement that plan. Final supplementary. Well, I can tell you, Speaker, that leader of the third party knows exactly what the Liberals are up to, which is why we didn't support their budget in the first place, Speaker, because we knew that this Premier was not being honest and upfront with the people of Ontario. That's what we saw in that budget. 
Ontario families actually own Hydro One Speaker. They deserve a say on the Premier's plan to sell off Hydro One. And in fact, the backbenchers actually deserve an ability to cast a free vote. Uh The member from Trinity Spadina. Um, I'm going to ask the uh, the leader to uh, withdraw. Oh, what? I withdraw, Speaker. Ask you to uh, finish putting your question. Speaker, the bottom line is the Liberals pulled a real sneaky fast one on the people of Ontario. Here, here. And what we want to see. Is That's not acceptable. Please withdraw. I withdraw, Sneaky. Speaker. Please finish. People of this province, whether the Liberals like it or not, own Hydro One. It is their right to decide whether or not it gets sold off. Will she hold a referendum and give them their voice? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Premier. Finance. Mr. Finance. Mr. Speaker, we're on the cusp of royal assent of Budget 2015, Building Ontario Up. It is one of the most progressive budgets to date, investing critical investments for the future generations of our province while enhancing and preserving quality of life for people all across, our, all, all across Ontario. And Mr. Speaker, we're also taking a very prudent and fiscal plan to balance while so doing. But it's possible because of the vision and the integrity of the Premier of this province. And we stand behind Premier Kathleen Wynne for all that she's done. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Order, please. No question. Member from Simple North. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, I'll try to tone it down a bit here, Mr. Speaker. Okay, so my question today is to the Minister of Education. <laughs> Minister, uh, no doubt you are happy to see uh, this session come to an end. It ends with our education system in complete turmoil. Uh, we know that almost non stop bargaining and negotiation will have to, have to take place to, uh, to occur to avoid turmoil on September the 8th. So I've heard you say that a lot of bargaining can take place in three months, and we have 96 days left until the new school year, Minister. So can you outline to the House your plans as Minister to avoid turmoil on September the 8th? Thank you. Minister of Education. That's very simple. We will be at the bargaining table. We will be negotiating. We will be working with the unions. We will be working with the school boards. and. Uh, that's the plan. Is we will be at the, we will be are quite willing to spend the summer negotiating, and uh, only through negotiations will we actually make, be able to uh, arrive at a collective agreement. You know, when we introduced Bill 122 and uh, passed Bill 122, we understood that we need everybody in. Member from Renfrew, second time. We understood that we need the government as the funder. We understood that we need to restore collective bargaining to the unions. We understood Answer. that the school boards have a role because they're the employers, and that all three Thank you. of those parties. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Minister, uh, I must say uh, I've enjoyed being your critic this past session or two. Uh, <laughs> since and since uh, July of last year, since July of last year, I've actually gained a lot of new friends in the in, as education stakeholders. But, but, but like you, I, like you, I have a passion, a passion interest in the education and training of the two million students here in Ontario. 
But, Minister, we have no agreements in place with none of the educators of the 72, of the 72 boards in Ontario as of now, and it started last fall. So, Minister, my question is this. As your critic, your friend, and your colleague here in the legislature, will your office <laughs> will your office send me a daily update on the process on the process of bargaining? The bargaining is taking place throughout the summer months, so that I can pass it on to my leader Patrick Brown and the rest of our PC caucus. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Minister. writing into the legislation a clause that said update your critic daily on what's happening at the bargaining table. In fact, I think I've said repeatedly that the only way, and this is serious, the only way we're actually going to get agreements is if we bargain at the bargaining table. Bargaining through the critics, bargaining through the legislature, bargaining through the media. The member from Windsor West come to order. The only place that bargaining works is at the bargaining table, and that is where we intend to be. Thank you. Thank you. New question. Member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, ever since the Premier blindsided Ontarians with her plan to sell off Hydro One, and the question is to you, Premier, the Premier has claimed that the Ontario Energy Board would protect. Ontarians from a privatized Hydro One and its desire for much higher rates. Then we learned she's stacking the OEB with energy industry insiders. Then we learned she's trying to get rid of consumer interveners at the OEB hearings. And the other day, her government tabled a bill that would allow the government to bypass the OEB altogether wow. whenever it wants to push through costly and risky mega projects that consumers will pay for. Why is the Premier weakening consumer protections at the Ontario Energy Board? Question. Thank you. Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, that accusation is so sweeping, so incorrect, Mr. Speaker, it's very, very difficult to answer. I'll answer that, Mr. Speaker, by saying that, number one, he already knows that the Ontario Energy Board has been reducing and cutting back requests for increases in rates, Mr. Speaker. He already knows that we've introduced legislation, Mr. Speaker, that gives, yes, gives us the authority to initiate transmission projects, which he calls uh, a project that, that sh we should not have the authority authority to do. We've had people say that we're going to lose authority uh, over the system, Mr. Speaker, because of Hydro One. Now he's going. He's telling us uh, that we, we ought not to have the power, Mr. Speaker, to initiate transmission projects. Mr. Speaker, he's all over the map. He's inconsistent, and he's repeated again yes, for the third time the conflict of interest issue at uh, at Ontario Energy Board, and he's dead Thank wrong, you. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. I, I can't see why having an evidence-based process for making a decision is a problem. Nonetheless, that's the way the government sees it. <laughs> Under the current law, the Ontario Energy Board must weigh the costs and benefits of a transmission project to see if it's in the public interest. But the government's new bill would bypass this open review process, allowing the government to ram through mega projects based on politics, not on evidence. Why does the Premier need yet another way to put her own political interests ahead of the interests of consumers and Ontario families? Good, sir. Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker. You see it, please. You see it, please. Thank you, Minister. The proposed enhancements would provide cabinet. We're from Hamilton Mountain, 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 second time. Uh, improvements, Mr. Speaker, would provide cabinet with the clear authority to identify priority transmission projects and eliminate the requirement, eliminate the requirement for the OEB to spend further time on basic principle of need. All other elements of the OEB's existing approval processes, including reviewing costs for prudency and allocation, would remain in place, except as, as we have further expanded uh, their authority, Mr. Speaker, in the legislation that we've introduced. Thank you. New question. The member from Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Good answer. Good answer. 
Minister, the week of June the 1st to the 7th, Ontario is celebrating Local Food Week, giving us the opportunity to thank our farmers for the safe, high-quality and tasty food that they produce. By buying local food, Ontarians are not only having access to food that's nutritious, delicious and environmentally friendly, they're also supporting local farmers and the local economy. And Minister, I want to tell you that I'm personally looking forward to the first crops being produced by Fertile Ground in Waterloo Region. That that is a farm share program to which my family belongs. Mr. Speaker, could the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs please update the House on Local Food Week? Thank you. Minister, Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Well, thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the hardworking member from Kitchener Centre for that wonderful question this morning. And uh, We do know the Kitchener area, the home of uh, the famous market at Elmira. And Mr. Speaker, we're uh, supporting our local food as part of our government's plan to grow the economy, create jobs, and foster a strong environment agri-food sector. Um, some time ago, Mr. Speaker, we introduced the Local Food Act, which was a product of all parties in this legislature. I always recognize the work that was done uh, by the honorable gentleman from Sarnia. As part of the Local Food Week, we were proud to announce that VG Meats will receive up to $948,025 through the Local Food Fund to help bring Ontario beef to more than 25 Longos grocery stores right across the Ontario, one being in the wonderful riding of Vaughan. Wow. And Mr. Speaker, and today we're holding our eighth annual Queens Park Farmers Market on the Answer. front lawn after question period. And we'll be releasing, Mr. Speaker, our first ever local food report detailing the progress we've made and our goals and targets established by the Local Thank Food you. Fund in the province of Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for his answer. And minister, I invite you to come to Kitchener Centre to visit our famous farmers market soon. Uh, minister, it is great to hear that the Ontario government is continuing to make these key investments in local food projects across Ontario. We all know that farmers do feed cities, and our government must continue to support farmers to build Ontario up. Farmers work hard all year round to bring food to our tables, and we know that Ontario consumers appreciate fresh local foods. I know I do. In 2013, the Premier challenged the agri-food sector to double its annual growth rate to create 120,000 new jobs by the year 2020. Mr. Speaker, could the minister please inform this House Question. during Local Food Week on the local food strategy to contribute to the Premier's agri-food challenge. Thank you, Minister. Good question. Mr. Great. Speaker, I want to thank the member from Kitchener Centre for supplementary. And I do take the opportunity to visit farmers' markets right across the province of Ontario, whether I'm in Elmira, Ontario, or Coburg, Ontario, or Collingwood, Ontario, or, or communities right across the province. There's no better experience, Mr. Speaker, than to visit a farmer's market. Since the Premier issued the, the growth challenge uh, to the, our sector last year, we have created 17,000 new jobs in the agri-food sector in Ontario, which has led to $1.1 billion in new exports. And This is all about making our investments in the agri-food sector. And Just last week, I had the opportunity to be with my good friend, the member from uh, Halton, um, Wellington, to uh, uh, to announce our, our great investment in the new Alora Dairy Research Station, something that will yes, put Ontario on the market internationally uh, when it comes to the uh, dairy sector. This new uh, state-of-the-art facility will help Thank develop you. new food products that are healthier, safer, and producer. New question, the member from oh, <laughs> the member from Carleton, Mississippi Mills. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister, your management of our health care system is a failure. You are cutting physiotherapy for seniors. You are cutting home care for people who want to be at home. You are cutting funding to hospitals and nurses are being laid off. And now you are cutting fees for services paid to doctors. Our doctors are the foundation of our health care system. They are not your employees, they are your partners. Your partners in health care deliver. You are not treating them with the respect that they are due. You are not dealing with them responsibly. You are not negotiating in good faith. Minister, will you talk to our doctors in the mutually respectful manner they deserve? The integrity Question. of our health care system is at stake. Thank you. 
Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Stand up for the PSW. Well, Mr. Speaker, it's partly because we are increasing our investments into community and home care. It's partly because we are increasing our investments in hiring more nurses and making sure that we're investing in those aspects of health care that truly do support our seniors and other vulnerables in society. That we've asked our doctors to help to work with us in this difficult uh, fiscal, uh, challenging fiscal time to actually pause in terms of the remuneration. And that's all we're talking about here, Mr. Speaker. We're talking about the compensation that the government pro provides to our doctors. And we've, what we've done after a year of negotiations with the OMA, we brought in an umpire, Mr. Speaker. We brought in retired Justice Warren Winkler to actually bring the two parties together to try and reach an agreement. At the end of the day, we were unable to do that. Judge Winkler implored the OMA to Answer. accept our offer. They didn't, but we were going ahead and implementing precisely what Winkler had recommended. Thank you. Supplementary. Minister, there are 28,000 doctors in Ontario who treat 320,000 patients every day of the year. Our population grows by 140,000 people every year, and our aging, high-needs population is also growing rapidly every year. The demand for Medicare in Ontario grows by 2.7 per cent every year, and yet government has committed to fund only a 1.25 per cent or less than half of that growth. Dr. Stephen Gradinsky, a, a pediatrician in my riding, tells me that two pediatricians are retiring in Ottawa and there are no new doctors to replace them. You need more, we need more doctors and your respons response is to cut fees for services paid to doctors. That is not going to work. This is a major disincentive for doctors to practice in Ontario. Minister, think of the 320,000 patients per day. They need our doctors. Will you get back to the bargaining table and do what is right? Thank you. Well, well, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the fact is that we actually have more than 5,000 more physicians oh, yeah. than existed in Ontario when we took office and when we came into office in 2003. But, Mr. Speaker, our doctors are precious to the health care system in this province. I'm a, a family physician and a public health expert myself and a member of the OMA, Mr. Speaker. I had the privilege just two days ago of sitting down with Dr. Michael Toth, who's a family doctor from southwestern Ontario, the new president of the OMA. We had a very uh, positive and engaging discussion. I know my ministry is actually sitting today again with the OMA as part of the Physician Services Committee to look at ways that we can move forward and come back to negotiations and discussions. There are many, many important issues that we depend on our doctors uh, in Ontario to help uh, us work through. They are important partners. They are a big part of the foundation of health care in this province. I look forward to continuing yes, to strengthen that relationship and working with them, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member from Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, the Minister of Education has finally admitted that class size caps are on the table. The Minister has also acknowledged that the government is a party at the table. But it's alarming that the Minister stubbornly refuses day after day to commit to keeping current class size caps under any deal she signs. Speaker, there is frankly no excuse for not stepping up and protecting the small class sizes and one-on-one -on -one time that families expect. Those small class sizes Deputy are House Leader, what quality time. education means, and our kids deserve nothing less. If the Liberal government refuses to step up and do their job for the families of this province, they'll be forcing all of our students into even larger classes this September and forcing our kids to pay the price in overcrowded classrooms. Speaker, will the Premier finally do the right thing? Will she do what her minister refuses to do? Will the Premier guarantee Question. that families and kids today, right here, right now, that current class size caps will be protected because that's the right thing to do for Thank students? You. Mr. Speaker, I know the Minister of Education is going to want to comment on the supplementary, but I just, I, I really need to uh, remark that this is a party that apparently is trying to find its way back to its voice and believes in collective bargaining, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. And I would just remind this party that part of that voice they're trying to recapture is a belief in the relationship with labour. That means collective bargaining, Mr. Speaker. And as the minister has said over and over and over again, the only place we're going to find a deal.
Finish, please. The only place we're going to get a deal is at the table. So I would expect that of all the parties in this House, the leader of the, the third party would support a collective bargaining process. That's what we're engaged in, and that's what we're going to let run its course, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to remind the Premier that some of these staff have been for nine months without a contract. You should try coming to the table rather than legislating them back to work. is abysmal at best. Not only have the Premier and government throwing our schools into chaos because of more than a decade of chronic underfunding, Minister they have also government services. zero respect for education workers, their professionalism, or their work environment. They brag about frozen funding. They brag about cutting $250 million from education. They refuse to admit that special education funding has been cut in many schools, including $6 million in Toronto alone. With one hand, they commit to community hubs, and with the other, they have closed or want to close more than 125 neighbourhood schools. And now, after all that, they want to go Question. even further to jeopardize small class sizes and one on one time our children deserve. Will the Premier stop the chaos her government has caused to our children's education by committing to protecting small class Thank sizes you. today and getting it? Thank you for your Sir, education. Yes, thank you. You know, I'm really not going to take a lecture here from the party that's only education platform in the 2014 election was let's take $600 million out of the spending on education and health care. And whose position just last week was let the teachers go back again 10 days after we end one strike because it was deemed to be unlawful. They voted for the teachers to go back out on strike again instead of getting kids back in the classroom. That's their record in education. But what I would say is the same thing I said to my critic for the for the official opposition. Is the, the member critic, from Windsor West second time. Answer. The critic for the third party is not part of the negotiating process. I'm not negotiating. Thank you. New, new question. The member from Newmarket, Aurora. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Minister, it's imperative that students across Ontario have access to high-quality post-secondary education. That's why last year our government issued an open call for proposals for post-secondary institutions to expand capacity in underserved areas as part of Ontario's major capacity expansion framework. Minister, I understand that a panel evaluated 13 proposals based on a number of clearly outlined criteria, including their ability to, ability to increase spaces in undeserved areas and offer a broad range of innovative, high-demand programs. Many of my constituents in Newmarket Aurora were delighted to hear that the province is supporting a new York University Markham Centre campus in partnership with Seneca College to the south of my riding. Mr. Speaker, can you please inform the members of the House Question. how our government is making post-secondary education more accessible in York Region Minister, through Ontario's the major Windsor capacity to expansion framework? Thank you. Minister Training College University. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Newmarket Aurora for that very timely question, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, a couple of weeks ago, I was pleased to be joined by several of my colleagues to announce our support for the first ever university campus in York Region, Mr. Speaker. After an open and transparent selection process, York University's proposal was most clearly aligned with the criteria set forward by the evaluation panel set up by my ministry. Mr. Speaker, the new campus will offer programs that incorporate experiential learning with an academic focus on business, arts, and social sciences. The campus received great support from the city of Markham, from York Region, and also from the employers. The campus will be close to local transit options and, and other facilities, Answer. such as sports fields, the YMCA, and that is Markham, Panam, and Parapanam Center. I want to congratulate York University, and also I want to thank, thank other institutions. Thank you. Supplementary.
Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that answer. Uh, it's reassuring to know that our government is committed to helping more students uh, pursue post-secondary education by putting the right spaces in the right places. Minister, uh, for many municipalities, having a post-secondary institution is important for economic and regional development. At the same time, it's absolutely necessary that our government ensures Ontario taxpayer dollars are being invested in areas where post-secondary education and training is most needed. Minister, York Region is just one Ontario area that is experiencing significant growth of college and university age students. I understand that our government will be issuing a second call for proposals in spring of 2016 for another expansion project to serve local demand in Peel and Halton regions. Minister, can you please inform the members of the House Question. more about this second call for proposals in Peel and Halton regions? Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member again for that uh, question. Mr. Speaker, the member is absolutely right. It's imperative that Ontario's tax dollars are invested in areas where the demand for undergraduate edu education will be strong and the gaps in access are expected. That's why I was also pleased to announce that our government will be using, will be issuing actually a second call for proposals in the fall of, in the spring of 2016, for another campus to serve the local needs in Peel and and Halton regions. Mr. Speaker, currently the combined 18 to 24 year old population in Halton and the Peel region is about 200,000, and despite this such a large university age population in these regions. The, this, these regions only have one university campus with 10,000 undergraduate full-time students. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, our government will continue to make post-secondary education more accessible to our young people to make sure that our people will get the best education ever they can receive. Thank you. Thank you. Your question, the member from Hall of Norfolk. To the uh, Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services, since November of last year, Native militants have shut down construction of the Provincial Highway No. 3 bridge at Cayuga, a $20 million project just down the Grand River from Caledonia. The Haudenosaunee Development Institute and the Six Nations men's fire activists have forced construction workers off the bridge. Now we've been waiting over six months to replace a deteriorating 1924 steel truss bridge. Minister. Patience is wearing thin. When will your government restore peace, order, and construction workers on the Cayuga Bridge? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Speaker. And once again, I will remind member that uh, when it comes to matters of uh, 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 policing operations that is within uh, the jurisdictions of uh, the Ontario Provincial Police Speaker, a very highly regarded professional organization uh, that uh, does excellent work, uh, work across the province. Speaker, I think it will be highly inappropriate uh, for any member of this house, especially the member of a member of a government, uh, to be speaking about uh, 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 police uh, operations and, and decisions uh, that they make. I think, uh, as Speaker, uh, uh, we support the work that our Ontario Provincial Police uh, does, especially the work they do in, in, in conjunction with our First Nations to ensure that we are working in a, in a respectful and, and, and a healthy uh, relationship, and I urge the members uh, to Answer. do the same. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. This uh, bridge shut down it requires urgent action. After years of delay, constant repair, load limits, lengthy detours, uh, the bridge is not safe for heavy trucks, for uh, oversized farm machinery. Haldeman County has no authority to force militants off the bridge when they've threatened construction workers. Ministry of Transportation has had no success. In spite of seven years of negotiation, in spite of conducting lengthy environmental and uh, archaeological reviews demanded by the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the same group that you have permitted to occupy Douglas Creek Estates in Caledonia for more than nine years now. This militant action continues on a provincial bridge, on a provincial highway, under a provincial contract. When will your provincial government step in and allow the safe opening of the Cuyuga Bridge? Okay. Okay. Thank you, 
Again, Minister, uh, uh, when it comes to uh, issues around uh, maintaining uh, peace and, and order, uh, we rely on our provincial police, the Ontario Provincial Police, as, as everyone knows, and they make those determinations. I think what we should, we should be promoting, Speaker, is, is more uh, a peaceful re resolution as, uh, of, of, of any dispute as opposed to uh, sowing seeds of discontent. Uh, and, and we very much uh, appreciate and recognize the work that OPP does with local communities in finding those resolutions, uh, and I wholeheartedly support them and will continue uh, to, to work with OPP and let them do their uh, work as they do so well in our communities across the province. Thank you. New question, the member from Hamilton East, Stony Creek. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. Speaker, the Pan Am Games kick off in a month. The CEO of the Games Committee has said that this will be a summer you'll never forget. Unfortunately for us, Speaker, this quote came from an article about traffic congestion. In less than four weeks, Pan Am lanes will be blocked off on highways into, out of, and through Toronto. At the Minister of Transportation's Stop the car. Minister of Energy. Please ask. Thank you. At the Minister of Transportation's technical briefings, a rosy picture was definitely painted. No real impacts on traffic, he said. But all of this was contingent on his faith-based transportation plan. 20% of drivers will stay off the road. Minister. What evidence do you have that this will work, number one? What metrics are you using? How will you measure your achievement against the 20% target during or after the Games? Question. Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Uh, thanks very much, Speaker. I know that on this side of the House and right across the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area, right across Ontario, Speaker, there is a ton of excitement about the fact that the Pan Am, Para Pan Am Games will be starting shortly. Speaker, that member should know, of course, that when we announced and provided the technical briefing with respect to the Pan Am, Para Pan Am transportation plan, uh, we did discuss a number of initiatives that are being brought forward and have already been brought forward. So, for example, Speaker, we're allowing spectators to use their games ticket to get onto public transit. Speaker, we're expanding high occupancy vehicle the lane network temporarily for vehicles with three or more people, public transit, games fleet vehicles, emergency vehicles, and taxi speaker. We're providing accessible transportation options, including pre-booked accessible parking, public transit, Answer. or specialized transit Answer. services. We're also, Speaker, providing information and planning tools to help people plan ahead and avoid any challenges Thank they you. might have. Thanks very much, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. It is clear that the government has uh, been expecting massive congestion along and has decided that, well, in just case of help, they've decided that it is the price the public has to pay, Minister of Tourism, Culture, although Sport. they've never asked. I call it their Ontario Traffic Premium Plan. The minister talks a lot about the evidence from London and Vancouver. Let me give you some numbers, Speaker, on uh, what happened in London and Vancouver. London achieved only 9 per cent reduction in peak uh, PM traffic during the Olympics and during the Paralympics and bit I'll move to a warning. Please finish. London achieved only 9% reduction in peak hour PM traffic during the Olympics and during the Paralympics, an abysmal 2%. They invested, I, I, this number is mind boggling, billions in transit and still couldn't achieve 20%. We know the consequences failing to reach a target. The Don Valley Question. Parkway, a quarter of its normal speed, Speaker, an hour and 15 minutes from the Gardner to the 401, at similar numbers throughout the whole, the whole network. Can the minister tell us what Thank his plan you. B is to avoid traffic? Thank you. Minister. Thanks very much, Speaker, and I thank the member for the follow-up question. What I didn't get a chance to talk about in my original answer, Speaker, was that this coming Saturday, the Union Pearson Express will launch and go into service, Speaker. In time, Speaker. 
in time for the Pan Am Para Pan Am Games, as this Premier and our government promised, Mr. Speaker. What I also didn't mention, Speaker, in my original answer was that the West Harbour GO station, formerly called the James Street North Station, in that member and that leader's community will be ready in time for the Pan Am Para Pan Am Games, Speaker. That's right. That's right. And, Speaker, I will wrap up by reminding all members in this House that perhaps the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek would know all of this if New question. Member from Cambridge. It is for the minister responsible for seniors' affairs. Speaker, I got to know many seniors while working as a nurse, and I know the importance of sustaining healthy, active, and engaged older adults. I am proud of the dedication of the minister and this government to take action to help seniors live their best life. This June, we celebrate the 31st annual Seniors Month in Ontario. In my community of Cambridge and Waterloo Region, Seniors Month is an important occasion filled with many local events and activities that engage and celebrate the active and vibrant seniors in my community. For 31 years, we've honoured the many contributions that seniors have made to this province, and we recognise their spirit that continues to shine regardless of age. Can the minister please share with us more details about Seniors Month and how Ontario recognises and celebrates Great seniors. Thank you. The Minister responsible for seniors' issues. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and thank to the member from uh, Cambridge for the question. Indeed, Speaker, we are happy to celebrate Ontario 31st anniversary of Seniors Month. Our theme this year is vibrant seniors, vibrant communities, acknowledging the remarkable, uh, remarkable spirit of our senior speaker. I was delighted to kick off Seniors Month on June 1st at Ryerson University where there is clearly a strong commitment and strong community dedicated to continuous learning for seniors. Speaker, the Seniors Month and beyond, I encourage everyone to reach out to the seniors in your lives and let them know we appreciate the work they have done for our home, Ontario. I thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister. I know how important it is to have activities that interest, engage, and inspire the seniors in our communities, especially during Seniors Month. And I've had the pleasure to regularly host events to connect with them in order to learn and discuss the issues facing seniors. Next week, in fact, I'll be visiting Heritage Meadows Retirement Home and listen to the seniors living in my riding of Cambridge. It's essential to remember that the number of seniors in Ontario will double over the next two decades, including many in this House, and the work we do for them is becoming increasingly important. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on the progress we're making as we mark the 31st annual Sp Seniors Month in Ontario? Thank you, Minister. Um, speaker, our action is strengthened by the work of hard-working local leaders like the member from Cambridge, who is so dedicated to seniors in her community. <laughs> Speaker, our Ontario Action Plan um, it covers many issues that affect seniors and has had a very overwhelming positive response. For example, we launched the very successful first year, first time seniors community grant, reaching out some 46,000 seniors in the first year. And this year, Speaker, doubling the grant thanks to the Premier and Minister Sousa, we are reaching some 72 plus seniors in every corner of our province. Uh, speaker, I'm proud to witness the strides we are making to help Ontario become the best place to age. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. And of course, the member from uh, Niagara West. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Um, my question today, Minister of uh, Culture, Tourism, Sport. Uh, minister, um, I know from our personal conversations that you have a deep and abiding sense of the importance of heritage in the province of Ontario, and I commend you for that. You've also shown an interest in a particular piece of heritage in my riding in Vineland, the Vineland Schoolhouse. As you know, the original schoolhouse was built in 1895. It's an extraordinary example of 19th century architecture. 
It has been important in the community, not just as a school, but a living, so to speak, example of Beamsville brickwork. I mean, there's an awful lot of history packed in that tiny schoolhouse. Here's the problem. 105 years of history, sorry, 120 years of history is going to come to an end on June 19th. That's when the wrecking ball comes to town and knocks it down. Minister, will you use your authority under the Heritage Act to intervene and save that schoolhouse? Question. Thank you. Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the member opposite uh, for the question, but also for his advocacy on this, uh, this issue. I know that over the last uh, several weeks, we've had many opportunities to talk about this uh, uh, this specific uh, schoolhouse, you know, 120 years, uh, you know, a lot of heritage, a lot of local heritage, and uh, a beautiful example of the type of architecture that was uh, that was developed 120 years ago. And uh, in fact, Mr. Speaker, I did receive uh, many uh, letters from the friends of the Vineland uh, Public School, and they've officially requested as well for provincial destination uh, designation. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Ontario Heritage Act gives the municipalities the tools they need to manage and protect their assets uh, and their heritage ad assets in their communities. And uh, we've uh, we've connected with the local municipality, uh, the township of Lincoln, and uh, presented uh, some options uh, for them. And uh, I hope they make best use of those options uh, to save this particular piece of uh, of uh, infrastructure and history. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And I, I do want to say, Minister, I do appreciate the fact that you contacted the. Uh, the town of Lincoln and you gave them options. Um, unfortunately, the town of Lincoln decided not to pursue those options. Their concern is they would be su sued by the local school board because the previous council had issued the demolition permit. The notion, and I think you shared this with me, of one publicly funded institution suing another publicly funded institution to get more money for the taxpayers to go to lawyers is preposterous. The schoolhouse gets knocked down all the same. So let me put this um, on the table because, as you know, come June 19th, this piece of history is gone forever. And as the expression goes, they don't make them like that anymore. Um, minister, will you let me put this on the table? Will you um, use your authority uh, as a minister? Having been in that position, I um, and I know the ministry. I know how much they care about heritage, and I know your phone calls get returned. Would you contact both the school board, and municipality, and try to pull them together with heritage groups before June 19th Question. to keep that living history alive? Thank you, minister. Uh, th thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, you know, as I was saying, we uh, we did contact uh, the uh, municipality of uh, Lincoln, and we have presented uh, some options for them uh, to assist in, uh, you know, preventing any type of uh, litigation uh, against uh, any of those uh, publicly uh, funded uh, organizations. We uh, believe that we've presented an option for them that would allow them to take uh, local control and really develop a, a solution that would work for everyone. You know, at the at the ministry, um, you know, this government, uh, we are committed to preserving heritage here in the province. Of Ontario. In fact, the Premier has asked me to uh, revisit culture and build a, a new framework for Ontario. And I know heritage will be a big part of that discussion in the fall. But I'm going to work with the Minister of Education. I will work with, uh, you know, with other ministries and uh, the people of Ontario to find uh, ways to better uh, look for better ways to preserve our Answer. history in the province of Ontario. And again, I want to thank the member for his advocacy on this issue. And we'll continue to work with both the, uh, the school board and the municipality if, if required. Thank you. No questions. The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Major infrastructure projects like the Pan Am Games are generating massive volumes of contaminated soil. The Ministry of the Environment and Climate Change does not track this soil, has no idea where it winds up. We do know that much of this contaminated soil has been dumped on prime farmland and protected lands in the Green Belt and the Oak Ridges Moraine, with the property owners believing they were accepting clean soil. Last October, the minister called this a top environmental and economic concern for Ontario and promised action by the spring. Well, the spring session wraps up today and nothing has been done. Why has the minister failed to take any action? Uh, thank you, Mr. Minister Speaker. I, and, uh, I just want, in preamble, I just want to say one thing. I was the mayor who hosted the last Pan Am Games in Canada yes. in 1999. And it's amazing to me how that party has found every opportunity to absolutely dis and degrade what is one of the most exciting events. It's the first time Shame. the Toronto area has had a major event. So, you know the 
what you're in for, and it's about, we're about to have the most historic moments in our province's history, Mr. Speaker. And the waste guidelines that were put out last spring are being reviewed very actively, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as is the development of the Waste Diversion Act, and I look forward to reporting back to the House and working with my critic on that. But you know, Mr. Speaker, it's a sad day on the eve of what will be a historic summer in Ontario and Toronto's and Hamilton's history that that's the kind of lemon sucking yes, we get from the party opposite, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'd like to do this and then I'll come back to the member. Uh, I have three quick uh, comments before we move on. Uh, just before we do move on to our uh, uh, bills, uh, I would like to draw the member's attention uh, to the fact that our table clerk, Ann Stokes, has announced that she's going to be retiring later this month. Therefore, therefore, this is her last day serving the table, and I hope that all members would join me in thanking Ann for a very long and successful career in public service and wish you the best in her years of retirement. And to make sure that you understand I didn't miss it this time uh, and we're on a happy note, uh, I have a sad note. This is the last day for our pages, no! but we do want to thank them for the wonderful work that they've done for us this last few weeks. Point of order from the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek. Correct the record. I'd like to inform the minister that my entire staff were at all technical briefings on the Pan Am Games. He's incorrect. That's. Uh, thank you. Thank you. The, uh, the member from Renfrew has got an extra chip in his pocket. Uh, the, the, the minister on a point of order. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is my pleasure to uh, welcome Monica Zhu, uh, Loretta Chen, and Michelle Liu, who are part of the TO 2015 Youth Summit, joining us here at the legislature today. Welcome. Thank you. And. Uh, just before we do do our last, I, I do want to uh, wish all of you a safe and uh, healthy uh, family time break, uh, but also to reinforce what I've said time and time again. Thank you for the hard work that you do, even when the House is not sitting. I know you go back to your constituencies and work hard. Please be safe this summer. Enjoy yourselves and enjoy your family. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What I would also like to say is uh, to the staff, to the staff here and to the clerks to the table and to all of the staff here at the legislature, thank you for a hard job done well. Thank you. We do have a deferred vote on the motion of third reading of Bill 6, an act to enact the Infrastructure for Jobs and Prosperity Act 2014. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bill.
Would all members please take their seats? On June 3rd, 2015, Mr. Nackley moved third reading of Bill 6. All those in favour, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Van Mayer. Van Mayer. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Gravel. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Balkas. Mr. Balkas. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Manga. Mr. Manga. Mr. Pratt. Mr. Pratt. Mr. Wong. Mr. Wong. Mr. Hunter. Mr. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Jassy. Mr. Jassy. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Darmerla. Mr. Darmerla. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Mr. Hogarth. Mr. Hogarth. Mr. Koala. Mr. Koala. Mr. Malone. Madame Malone. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mrs. Nidu Harris. Mrs. Nidu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mrs. Verniel. Mrs. Verniel. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Huda. Mr. Huda. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Vantal. Ms. DeNovo. Ms. DeNovo. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Armstrong. 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 Ms.
On March 26, 2015, Mr. Murray moved second reading of Bill 66. All those in favor, please raise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Matthews. Mr. Matthews. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Madame Mayor. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Dugas. Mr. Dugas. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Balkasin. Mr. Balkasin. Mr. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Ms. Manga. Ms. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Jassic. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Domerla. Ms. Domerla. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mrs. Naidu Harris. Mrs. Naidu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Vernil. Mr. Vernil. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tabins. Mr. Tabins. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Vanta. Mr. Vanta. Ms. Denovo. Ms. Denovo. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Madame Gelinas. Madame Gelinas. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Shamanta. Mr. Shamanta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. All those opposed, please raise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. The ayes being 73 and the nays being 17, I declare the motion carried. Second reading of the bill, does the election close to the law? Pursuant to the order of the House dated June 2, 2015, the bill is ordered referred to the Standing Committee on General Government. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.